Welcome to the Short Term Show, the show about short term rentals and long term wealth, with real property owners hosting real properties who are crushing it in the vacation and short term rental space. And here's your host, Avery Carl. Did you know that we're officially back in a buyer's market? That's right. Even though interest rates continue to rise, they are causing prices to fall. So there's finally room for you to do regular real estate investor things that we couldn't do for so long, like gas, negotiate, make lower offers, ask for sellers to cover some of your closing costs. So it's a really great time to buy in terms of being able to get a lower purchase price and being able to negotiate. So if you're looking for your first or next short-term rental, it's a perfect time to reach out to us at the short-term shop. Let our team of agents in any of our true vacation market destinations help you find the perfect investment. Jump on over to the shorttermshop.com and click get connected to get started. We are brokered by EXP Realty. See y'all over there. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Show. I've got a really cool guest here today who's done a lot of cool things. I've got Brandon Steiner. How's it going, Brandon? It's going great. Uh, I'd be, I'd be loving, I'd be loving more to be down in Florida with you, but I'm gonna have to settle for Westchester today. All good. <laughs> Westchester's not so bad. No, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I mean, especially where I grew up. I mean, geez, you know, I never thought I'd be living in Westchester. This was like the country back when I grew up in Brooklyn. So I'm feeling like way ahead of the game. But yeah, I mean, if you're going to live in New York City and you get it, you know, you go, you can go, you know, get a, a nice little spot in Westchester. I live in Scarsdale. It's amazing. Um, it's uh, expensive, but you know, it's just amazing place if you can afford it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What part of Brooklyn did you grow up in? Flatbush, Kings Highway, Ocean Parkway, but mostly everything great that's ever happened, you know, starts with somebody in Brooklyn. I mean, it, it, almost all the great things in the world. When you look at some of the great inventors, and that's just because it's the fourth largest city in the country. And also the insanity, the cross section of people, and also the volume of people per square mile. You have got to learn one of the more important ingredients, which is how to get along and, and understanding people. Forget about liking people. You got to understand how people operate and work, or you're going to get your butt beat. Like it's not going to work out for you, like quickly. And there's not many. Yeah. There was not many walks of life of every kind of gender, color, race. I mean, that doesn't you know cross the streets in Brooklyn. So, so, so you really kind of get an education just by growing up there fully. In my mind, yeah. I did not grow up there, but I did spend a good part of my 20s there, and I'm very, very grateful for that time. I lived. I lived in Bushwick for the first part and then uh, Columbia Street. Depending on what cab driver's driving you home, they'd either call it Carroll Gardens or Cobble Hill, but a really, really cool, fun area. So back, like back in the day, me even walking around Carroll Gardens would be, you know, a risk of my life. And now, the you know, Yuppiesville, and that's like such the cool place. It's amazing the turnaround of those areas in Brooklyn because those are some bad, 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 you know, you didn't just walk around in those neighborhoods easily back, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, which is what made Brooklyn so special. Like, you know, in any given neighborhood, it could be, you know, you could be risking your life quickly and then you could be going into, you know, the rich and famous as well. It's crazy. But I don't regret yeah. one day of it. Definitely not going back. No interest, you know, going backwards other than get some Spumoni Gardens, l &B Pizza, Coney Island, where I went to high school, um, that kind of stuff. But I remember I tell my friends when I told them I was going to Syracuse, they were just shocked. There's nobody in the neighborhood went to, went out sta upstate. Went to, you, know, you went to Brooklyn College, went to Baruch in the city. I said, like, I'm not only going to Syracuse, I'm not coming back. They're like, what, what are you going to do upstate New York? I said, you know, something, with, I'll figure it out, but I'm not coming back. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with the streets of Brooklyn. So, and that Syracuse is a big break for me, especially, um, you know, nobody saw me come in. I, you know, I had really, I struggled in school. I went to a Pathville High School. And to go to one of the more, more expensive private schools in New York was almost like a Hail Mary lottery ticket uh, entrance for me. And it worked out for me. I, I made it through. Well, yeah. So we've been going on about Brooklyn for a minute, but let's talk about how that worked out for you. So can you just tell our audience a little bit about yourself, the businesses you built, the books you've written, 
all that all that really impressive stuff? I mean, you know, for me, it's it's been a great journey. It's actually an epic, but in a long story short, you know, I've written three books. I'm half illiterate and and have a real hard time reading and writing, but I felt there was a good need with each one of my books to write those books. Um, I started Steiner, which is I'm not with Steiner anymore, which is very weird even to say it, but that was a great company. But I started Collectible Exchange four years ago. Steiner Sports was really the preeminent collectible company in the world. Uh, it was awesome what we did. I, I think I got a better mousetrap, better plan now. Um, you know, I've been marketing players, and that's what people don't realize, which is the relationships, which we'll get to in this in this conversation. Like the relationships are everything. And what enabled me to make the millions doing collectibles was I was marketing athletes, still do it to this day. And I've done thousands and thousands of player appearances to help companies grow, speaking engagements, PR, advertisements, commercials, trade shows, that kind of thing. And at one point in the early 90s, I was just moving, you know, two, 3,000 athlete appearances a year, moving athletes all over the country. And that's how I really got in with all these athletes, some really big names, actually. And then I started the collectible company. Um, you know, for me, I, you know, I speak, I do a lot of coaching or, or do a bunch of coaching. Um, I love the real estate business. Don't like it. Love it. And I'm completely an immigrant. I'm, I'm a real estate immigrant. Like I just started three years ago when the virus hit and I wasn't sure the new collectible company, how fast it was going to grow. I met, I'd done a couple of talks for this real estate firm and I just literally sat in an office with one of the top guys and just sit down and watched and learned. I can't emphasize I think the key to me is, is you know, my, I always consider myself a rose, my rate of self-efficiency. You have to be growing. You know, if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotten. And if you rest, you rust. Like, regardless of your age, regardless of how much money you make, if you want to get to a happy place, you've got to be in growth mode and gratitude mode. I always say that happiness resides on the cross sections of gratitude and growth. So, you know, I went in and, you know, I wasn't sure I, I, I was thinking about retiring. And so I got into this real estate thing and I, I was like, wow, what an industry. I was like, this is unbelievable. And then at the same time, I'm building collectible exchange, you know, the way I want to build it, which is, which I think sometimes people get lost with the speed. Everything's got to happen quickly. I'm like, you can build things methodically, strategically and execute as such. It's okay to do that. Um, I think now everybody thinks that it should be over, an overnight success. There's so much pressure to show results on a minute-to-minute, day-to-day basis. But the great relationships, the great things that you're going to do in life is not going to probably happen overnight. So stop thinking that way and be, play the long game. And that's been my story. I mean, honestly, like, I'm, a, I'm the long game guy. Like, I don't even at 60, starting a new company, starting a new profession in real estate on the side, like a kind of a side hustle like. Why not? You know, like, and it's been really amazing. Like, I'm able to take some of my experience in the sports business. Um, you know, I took four thousand dollars, turned it to fifty million. Imagine if I took four thousand in real estate; I could have made even more. I think it just would have been amazing. Now knowing what I know, so lots. You know, for me, it's been a great journey and a lot of ups and downs, especially working with athletes, Muhammad Ali, Peyton, Eli Manning, or, or Derek Jeter. And I've had those athletes for many, many years and been able to put collections and products and, and all kinds of different appearances together with them. Um, now I'm a lot more, I'm a tech, I'm a techie. You know, my new collectible exchange is like a tech platform where you can buy and sell. It's a very much a form of eBay, but with all the services that people I felt needed. I think people, I think eBay is an amazing platform, but when you get into collectibles, like people, you know, your dad dies or you want to downgrade, people don't know what to do with their stuff. And you need authentication, you need verification, you need to understand what things are worth. So our site does all that. And it's, I think we have 150,000 items on there now and growing. And we're still learning, you know, we're still building it. And, and I'm not a techie, so I've got all these young kids around me, you know, teaching me how to take the things that I've learned and kind of put them into modern day age. And I think they, that's another thing you can't do enough of is surround yourself with people that not be afraid to surround yourself with reverse mentoring. Like I, I mentor a lot of kids, but there's a lot of kids mentoring me. I need that help, you know, and, and it's amazing how much I think I know and how little I know at the same breath, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I totally agree with that. <clears throat> so would you say, so since being involved with the sports business for decades, would you say that 
the a lot of the transferable skills from athletics transfers over to investing in or working in the real estate business? I think 100 percent. I mean, the correlations are just insane. And, you know, listen, I think anything really anything special is starts with relationship building and learning how to initiate a relationship uh, or how to grow one. I think that's the tough part these days. It's, it's not as easy um, with all the social media and all the different ways to communicate. You know, how do you initiate a relationship? And customer acquisition has definitely gotten a lot harder. Um, and, you know, the sports thing has evolved. When I got into it in the late 80s, you know, it was like Christopher Columbus coming over to America. Like, this is unbelievable. Now it's like, you know, the teams have grown. There's a lot more evolved. There's a lot more levels as there is in real estate. So you you, you got to first and foremost, you know, get the blocking and tackling down. I see in this huge surge in real estate, a lot of people jumped in. They just thought it was easy. And we know there's nothing easy. And they got a lot of easy listings. They did a lot of easy deals with so many people buying, selling. The interest rates are low. What I love about this market is that the interest rates popped up a little bit. And what it does is it just pushed all the crap and all the weak links, the guppies, it pushed them out. Uh, They crowded the space anyway. They weren't doing any justice. I always say when the waters get rough, the sharks keep swimming. You don't see any sharks coming up the shore, but the little guppies and the weak fishes, you know, all the people that really weren't weren't really as knowledgeable, didn't take the business as seriously as they should. Those are the ones that are really struggling now. I think when you get into these kind of markets, and I've been through a few of them, now's the time when your relationship build, you plan your future, you put your hooks in the water, and you add in a few more poles. You double down on what has been successful for you, and you double down on that. And uh, that's kind of been my philosophy in business. Like, I love environments when things change and, and, and things get a little bit rogue and things get a little bit, you, know, you face an adversity, like double down, like triple down, because everybody else is pulling back. And uh, I think that's when you can excel. But you have to have the product knowledge. You know, you got to do your homework and you got to be learning. And in real estate, yes, there are some pretty common ways to do deals, but, the, you know, the real the real good, great deals need some complexity. You need to be learning, following, getting to these seminars and, and constantly just upgrading your game on the basic fundamental aspects. Because the difference between real, you know, what I find in real estate, I just can't believe how many different ways there are to go do a deal. Uh, it, it's really such a great entrepreneurial sport. And uh, that's what I've been enjoying. And that's what I, I try to impress upon even your listeners is like, realize the game that you're playing has 80 zillion ways to play it. You know, and all these games come with fundamentals and they come with rules and they come with regulations and they come with a lot of ways to spin it. And if you put enough time and energy into it, you'll then be in a position to relationship build and take advantage of the knowledge you have, which the beautiful thing is who's not at some point in their life doing some real estate deals, renting, buying, investing. I mean, so think about all the different opportunities and transactions that are available to you, especially if you're really good at it. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think you're absolutely right. So, you know, 18 months ago, it was so impossible for our clients. It wasn't impossible, but there were so many people offering on every single deal that it wasn't necessarily, you didn't have to worry about the number that a seller was willing to take. You had to worry about the number that all the 20 other people offering on the same property were offering. So I really, I know a lot of agents would disagree with me here, I have I like the fact that a lot of those weaker links have been shaken out because now the investors who truly do treat real estate investing as a business and not just a oh look um looks like the interest rates are t- at 2% I can finally afford that beach house that I to impress my friends with. Now the people who are actually looking at it as a business which is what our true client base is, they're able to get those better deals because they have the time to think about what they're offering and what makes sense and you know what what number they would need to offer for the deal to make sense for them because there's not a thousand other people clogging up the feed so to speak. They they have the time to negotiate, to run numbers and to do all these things because all of those guppies as you put it are up on the beach and the sharks are still swimming. And I think that there's really a lot of opportunity to get really good deals right now, purchase price wise, because those interest rates are higher and, um, you know, it's scared off a a lot of the weaker ones. 
I'll tell you a story. I, I think this can relate to it. You know, I, I ask I ask anybody that's listening, like, do you want to compete? You know, would you rather win a game 15 to nothing or lose a game three to two? Are you into this? Are you into the game for the for the competition or you just want to win? Because to me, I think you ask anybody who's had success, they'll tell you that the process and the grind and everything they'd had to do was a hell of a lot more fun than the actual result of making a ton of money. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. So I'm sitting in uh, spring training and I had an appearance with Mariano Rivera. And I was going to meet him after the game, and we had an appearance to do. So at the fifth inning, all of a sudden, somebody comes. It's his next man. Turn on. It's Mariano there. I go, what are you doing? Now, I got to admit, it was cool. I mean, sitting next to, like, the Yankee Rays closure. And we, we're now watching the spring training game. He goes, bro, did you not see? I, I asked Joe, with Joe Torre at the time, to, to pitch early so I could leave and we can go do the appearance. I said, you know, I wasn't quite paying attention. He goes, that was one, two, three. I just knocked them out. I pitched the fifth inning, one, two, three, boom, I'm here now. I said, well, it's just a spring training game. Who cares? He goes, no, 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 no. When I go on the mound, whether it's a spring training game, whether it's opening day, World Series game seven, game on the line, I pitch exactly the same way. I mowed those guys down in spring training, one, two, three, the same way I would if it was World Series game seven. I never changed my mindset, ever. There's no such thing as a big game. This way, when I get to a big game and it's the middle of the season, the playoffs are on the line, and I get on the mound, I don't have to adjust my mental, physical, nothing. I do what I do. I never have to question it. And what happens is a lot of people take the big game, the big meeting, the 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 what does that mean? What what are you saying about all the other meetings? What are you saying? You have a big call about all the other calls. Would you do you want your doctor to come in for surgery? Ah, this is not a big surgery. You know, the great ones never differentiate the day, the economy, the interest rate, never alter your approach. And it was a great, valuable lesson. Like, if you want to be extraordinary and great, you have to be consistently great all the time. Consistency over time equals credibility. And if you're altering your approach, depending on what you appear to be a good deal or an important person, when somebody comes in, they want to buy something for me for a hundred dollars. I treat them the same way. If someone was coming to spending a million, I get excited. I want to compete. I want to do the best that I possibly can for them. I never alter my approach. So think about it. If you're out there, you're listening. Like you know, it, do you treat the small little investment property the same way as you would if it's some huge multi million dollar one? The person who's maybe renting an apartment the same way as if someone's spending five million on buying a house. But I think ultimately you got to treat everyone the same. And I think if you do that, you won't get caught up with maybe misguiding yourself because maybe that one person who's just renting an apartment today ends up buying a house for $10 million, you know, five years later. Yeah, absolutely. How you do anything is how you do everything, right? Sell with the short-term shop. Are you looking to sell your short-term rental or even 1031 into a different property? Our team of realtors will work hard to get you the most for your investment. We are experts in our field. And Management Monday is proud to present this episode of the Short Term Show. Management Monday is a weekly course that will teach you everything you need to know about managing a short-term rental from a distance. How to get more bookings, hire ADR, how to hire and fire vendors, even if you don't want to manage it yourself, you need this course so you know how to manage your manager. Over 10,000 super hosts started their career with Management Monday. And the best part is, it's free for short-term shop clients. Start your journey today at theshorttermshop.com. Theshorttermshop.com. And a lot of times, I know for at least myself as an investor, you know, some of our investments are bigger, like apartment buildings or big vacation rentals that are in the million dollar range. But then if we're going to buy a single family long term, that's $150,000, we're probably going to buy 10 of them because one by itself doesn't make sense. But at scale, it does. So um, we've been really fortunate in the agents that we've hired to work for us that that they do treat even the $150,000 investment just like the million dollar investment because over time it does become a million, $2 million 
investment just over the course of 10 transactions. So you never know. You never know. And and that's the thing. If you can realize that you're all, you know, you're going to have some ups, you're going to have some downs, but if you can keep being consistent and make sure that you're just growing, you know, you're just constantly getting better. You know, it's like beat yesterday. Another thing is also wake up broke. It's one of my favorite lines. Like, even though I've done really well when I started this new company, Collectible Exchange, I didn't, well, I did this. Oh, I sold $50 million of dirt. I've secured 30 million autographs. No, I'm broke. I'm not resting on anything I've done in the past. I'm using the same things that I did when I was 30, when I was 28 years old, when I was just getting started. I use the same principles. I don't say, well, I've made millions of dollars on this and that. No, no one cares. I go back to the same principles. And I'll give you an idea. So it was the Black Lives Matter, if you remember, a couple of years ago. And there were craziness going on in the city. And we had just started our company. And I realized this woman had called up to buy a gift for her f- husband's 50th birthday. So I go back in the warehouse. And I'm like, what the hell? What, what is this doing here? Oh, we forgot to ship it. I said, this is this lady's husband's birthday. I mean, seriously? So I called my wife. I said, honey, I'm, I'm going to be home late. What are you doing? I said, I got to buzz into the city. I got to deliver this. It's crazy in the city. It's dangerous. You shouldn't be going. I said, honey, I'm, I'm going into the city. I'll be home a little late. And I, I delivered the thing. I went you know, through a maze. It was really crazy in the city with everything going on between the virus and the Black Lives Matter protests. And I find this building. There's a doorman. The lady comes down. She can't believe it. I can't believe you're delivering this. I said, it's your husband's 50th. And you know that's the message I want to my, that I want to send to my people that, no, it's not about we were, used to be this big company. And no, like everything matters. And if you make a promise, keep it, even if it's not convenient. I always say commitment is not always convenient. And I, you know, it's a big message to my staff. You know, you know, in this new company, I only have 11 employees. In the old one, I had over 120. But I'm like, everything matters. Treat people great. Go out of your way. It's so just a little stuff. It's not complicated. And as a leader, you want to set the example. And you know, leadership is really not that complicated. Fix what's broken. Take what you already do well and make it better. And any act of kindness to help another human being is an act of leadership. So if you're a leader and everyone can be, just three simple things. Fix what's better. Fix what's broken. Take what you're already doing and figure out how to do it better. I went back and thought about all the best things I did over the last 30 years. I'm like, I'm not going to let those slip away, but I'm going to figure out how to go do them better. Because a lot of it, a lot of success, sometimes you leave in some success on the, on the floor. A lot of success, you got so excited about that success, but you didn't finish the story. You can go back to it and start thinking about how you got that success and replicate it. I totally agree with that. And I think that your point of relationship building is is really important, especially in real estate. So I would be curious to hear when you're just getting started and, and you're in your sports memorabilia business and you're talking about getting these big autographs. So if you're just starting in that business and you've got these crazy, really famous baseball players, basketball players, football players, what have you, how do you go about getting that first big autograph? Same way to go about getting anything that's important, any relationship I'm getting started, that's value. You know, you have to produce value. And value is what you can do for someone they can't do for themselves. So as, as a business person, you want to be a, a solution-based business person. You need to find almost like the doctor when they come and check you and they start poking around. Does this hurt? Does that hurt? Does this hurt? Does that hurt? You that, that Everybody needs some help. And if you can provide value, no matter how big, rich, ex- celebrity, it doesn't matter. Everybody needs some form of help. If you can find out the help that they need and provide it, even though it's not convenient, and it may not even fit into your core competency, because you're not going to get rid of somebody that adds value, that's doing something for you that you don't want to do or you can't do. And that's been my mantra since I'm a kid, something my mother taught me at an early age. You know, I was... Uh, I was like 12 years old when I started my paper. I'd already been on the streets for like three years. I was hustling and trying to make some money. So, you know, it was, it really wasn't, you know, I got evicted from my childhood at an early age. I was off to the races and trying to really keep my house afloat with my father disappearing. And, and you know, my mother was a single uh, mom. So I come home and I'm trying to open up these accounts. And, I, you know, if, if whoever opened up the most accounts that month win a box of candy bars, I'm thinking, shit, I'm winning these box of candy bars. I got it. It's, I mean, that's like, that's gold. I think. Mean, 
And so I come home after like being out for a week and I'm a relentless kid in a Brooklyn knocking on apartment building doors and no one, this one woman answers the door and says, said, no, I'm not going to get the paper delivered from you. I, I, I'm, I get it from the corner store. I said, ma'am, it's the same price. She says, yeah, but then I got to tip you. I go home. I tell my mom, I got to move out of this neighborhood. The people are cheap. This is a no good neighborhood. This doesn't make sense. My mother's like, sit down now. You got to stop selling. You got to be a solution-based business person. You got to think about how you can serve or solve, be a solution-based business person. So I was trying to get my arms wrapped around that. The lady was like 80 years old. I started knocking on doors, apartment building, nothing. At On a Thursday night at 1030 at night, I knocked on this woman's door. She thought there was a fire in the building. Are you kidding? It's 10 I said, man, torrential downpour, snowstorm, sleet on the ground, ice on the ground, heat wave. A woman such yourself should not be outside. If I bring you milk and bagels on Wednesday and Sunday, and if you need something else, I'll get it for you. And the paper will be delivered, rain, shine, 7.30 a.m. Would you get the paper delivered? She says, oh, that's so nice. I said, I was concerned. I didn't realize this woman was the mayor. Now, I had 29 dailies at the time. She turned me on to everyone. I went up to 199 dailies and two boxes of uh, bars. It was unbelievable. But, you know, the thing about that story is, is that obviously, you know, are you listening to your customers? Are you trying to solve a problem? Are you really trying to find the white space? But what I think is really interesting to answer your question is it's a pivotal moment in my life because as a 12-year-old, I actually, I, people say, well, how do you increase your sales? How do you get started? Well, you just said, and, and it is like common sense. That's how. If you can increase your common sense, which is empathy. Empathy is putting yourself in a common person's shoes. As a 12-year-old, I figured out how to put myself in a 70-something-year-old woman's shoes. And got out of my head and started thinking what it was like to be her. And I started realizing when the weather was bad, she was in trouble and I was going to help her. It wasn't convenient. But at some point, I was delivering more milk and bagels than you can imagine. Two shopping carts a day to deliver the papers, the milks, everything. I was racking. But what I learned at that time is value. How do I kind of provide value for people that they can't do themselves or they don't want to do? So when you ask me a question like that, it's like when I meet a Derek Cheater. A Muhammad Ali, Marianne over there. Like, first thing I think about is what can I do for them? Like, Derek was starting a foundation. So I started zoning in on his foundation, helping him with his charity stuff, helping his family put together different charity events. And that led me to the promised land. I didn't know Derek was going to be Derek. You never do. You can't start betting on the horse who's about to finish 10 lengths ahead. You got to bet on that horse when, you know, early on. And you, you got to be able to put out those feelers, you got to be able to go out of your way and do those things. And you do that by increasing your empathy. You increase your compassion for the people you meet. And when you meet somebody that seems like a good person, they seem like a solid person, you know, it's, it's a risk. I mean, you may, you may do all these things for somebody, you may not get anything back, but I would say do as much as you can for as many people as you can, as often as you can, and expect nothing back. And the key underlying common denominator to compassion and empathy is enthusiasm and curiosity. Enthusiasm, the root word, enthusios, is to be with God. So you have to have some faith that you're going to provide value, do the right thing, and good things will happen. And you do it with curiosity because remember, when you're 11, one of the things I always remember, at 11 and 12 years old, everything's possible. You could be the next shortstop for the Yankees. You could be the next president. You could be whatever. But what gets you wherever it is you're going is curiosity, asking questions. And if you stop, if you continue to be curious, even when you do learn a lot, and even if you have been successful, if you can keep your level of curiosity and still have faith, and faith is believing in something you can't see. So, yeah, you met somebody. I don't know. Are they going to give you that bliss thing? I don't know. Are they going to be building many buildings in the future? I don't know. But you have to have some faith that at some point by putting out this good and doing as much as you can and you're doing it with curiosity, maybe it will maybe they'll, they'll shine. Like that lady, man, she brought me the whole freaking neighborhood I was delivering papers to. And all it did is starting with a little bit of common sense, say, hey. If the weather's bad, how's the lady getting milk, bagels, and everything else? And boom, I was hitting a gold rush. So if you take that up a notch, I, every time I've met a celebrity or somebody of wealth, the first thing you think of, and tell me if I'm lying, 
What can I get from that person? That's me unbelievable. I met this incredible person and it's going to lead me to a lot. But what I think about, not what I can get, but what I could give. What am I possibly going to do for this person that they maybe need some help with? How am I going to, and whatever it is, in my space, out of my space, whatever it is. And you get there by asking the questions enthusiastically to find out what they're possibly going to need. And that's my key to them. And that's my key to growing a business. You know, gratitude, growth. That's, that's being my a story go-giver. and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're being a go-giver and not a taker. Yes. It's the only you way. Mentioned- and, and by the way, the go-giving is so much more, you know, helping people is not a, it's not a burden. It's, it's actually, it's an opportunity to get you to share joy. Like when you help people, I, I hate to get on this rant, but I will. I, I, I'm sorry. Like, the only reason you're here, there's only two reasons why you're on this freaking planet. And one reason is to help others. And the second reason is to grow and get better. So, you know, when you look at all the species that the good Lord, whoever you believe in a higher power that created this beautiful earth that we live on, I mean, think about all the species, bugs, animals, tigers, bears, birds, you can name them, zebras, lions, cows, none of them, and I mean none, can get better. None of them can deal with adversity, adverse conditions. If they get thrown a curveball, they die. An elephant, by the way, who lives many, many years. You know why they die? They die. They eat 17 hours a day. They poop, try to find some sex, and sleep for a few hours. That's what an elephant's life is. 17 hours of eating. You know why they die? Not of old age. They die of malnutrition. You know why? Because they only get two sets of teeth. And after the second set of teeth start windling down and start eating 17 hours, they can't eat all the branches and all the grazing that they need to do. And they die of malnutrition because they cannot adjust and adapt to the environment. So when I look at all these species, the only species that can adapt, and we've seen it with this virus, we've seen it over and over and over again in our, from what we know about human life, is that we are able to adapt. We are able to adjust. We can adjust to a few points that go up in your interest rates, for God's sakes. I mean, right? We can adjust. Like That's the beautiful thing about being human. So if you're not adjusting and growing, which is half the reason why you're here, and the other half is to try, try to help as many people as you can. That's why God put us here. He didn't give us all the solutions. He gave us each other to try to help each other through whatever problems, whatever it is we need to get through. And if you can follow those two simple paths, you're on your way to extraordinary. <laughs> Well, we could definitely stop the interview right there. That was definitely a mic dropper. Um, I do have another question, though. You mentioned something earlier that you called ROSE, the rate of self-efficiency. Am I right on that rate of self-efficiency? Yeah, your rate of growth is everything. Like, If you really want to see how you're doing, stop looking at your damn bank account and stop looking at at how many likes you got, but look at your rate of growth, like your rate of self-efficiency means every day, did you get a little better? Did you learn something new? Did you figure out a better or smarter way to go about your day, your business, how to be a better husband, how to be a better brother, how to be a better friend? That's what's going to get you happiness. And that's what's going to really, that's wealth. Show me somebody who's growing and somebody who's actually managing their growth, not just hoping they're going to grow. And he's probably somebody who's sitting on the top of the mountain. And is not giving up because he's fighting another mountain to climb. Well, this has been a really, really <laughs> insightful chat. And I think that our listeners are really going to enjoy it. But uh, we're running out of time. And so we're to the last three questions of the call that we ask everyone. So first question, what advice would you give 20-year-old Brandon? I think relentless is, being relentless is underrated these days, but don't be stupid about it. You know, just, you know, don't keep banging on a door that no one answers. I always say, don't be stuck on stupid. Sometimes your idea isn't that good. But dream big, sample small, and fail quick is part of the equation as much as being aggressive and being relentless about going after what you want. Okay, that kind of ties into our next question. What advice would you give a new real estate investor or real estate agent, anybody in the real estate realm who's never done it before looking to get started today, right here in Q, what are we, Q3? We're still Q3 of 2024. Uh, 23. Well, Q3 of 2023. Is, <laughs> yeah, number one, I go I go find somebody who's really good at it and, and try to get, get on their team. You know, you don't have to, you know, Rome wasn't built on a day, but they were working on it every day. Like, 
get re, get into the fundamentals of it. You know, try to get you know your courses and you know you got to get your real estate license. But try to get on a team with talented people. I think I can't say enough, especially when you're young. You know, the one of the most important things in your life is like who raised you. You know, your mom is the most important thing in life. I, my second book, You Got to Have Balls, is everything my mother taught me. I made a fortune. I was one of those kids that listened to his mother. Like, I think when, you get, when you're 20, you're about to get into the second phase of the most important thing, which is who you're going to learn your business lessons from. So going to work for somebody, regardless of how much money you're getting paid, but working for a high quality person who's going to show you high quality ways to make money in real estate is critical. Like working for somebody like yourself, hitch on, glue yourself, and then, you know, try to learn and follow the leads and the directions and, and, and all that stuff is, is really important. And a lot of times when you're young, you just focus on how much money you can make as opposed to thinking about what you could build and who's going to show you how to build it. Totally agree with that. Thank and you. last <laughs> last question, um, what is your favorite book that's impacted your mindset? Oh, boy. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean this is just some of them, you know. But, I mean, listen, I'm a Harvey McKay disciple. Like, I don't know where I'd be without Harvey. I, I've made, a, I've had a great relationship with him for years, but I, I was reading everything he wrote before he, I ever met him. I was his friend before I ever said hello to him. Um, so, you know, swimming with the sharks, everything they, they didn't teach you at Harvard Business School, just basic stuff of what you do when you walk in a room and how you start a relationship. I think Harvey delivers that. The what they didn't teach you at Harvard Business School, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Those are just no brainers. I mean, absolute. Now, when you get into leadership and a more advanced business, there's some better books. But I think when you're just getting started early on in your career, those are three must books Swimming with the Sharks, um, How to Win Friends, Influence People, um, you know, everything you learn at Harvard Business School. I mean, there's so many of those types of books, and you can't read enough of them. Uh, for me, you know, I, I've read quite a few of them, and I watched the beautiful thing. If you're not a big reader, you can go on YouTube and literally, you know, get the get, you know get the cliff notes and just look up great subject matters and just watch, you know, inspirational talks by great leaders that you respect. And you can always pick up the keys and the secrets to their sauce. And I do that, by the way, still to this day. I still watch at least one or two hours of YouTube every weekend just on different people that I kind of look up to and respect and see where their heads are at or how they did what they did. All right. Great, great recommendation. So Brandon, if other people, as I do, I expect other people will too, want to buy your books, read them, follow you on Instagram, where can they do or, or any social media or website, where can they do that? Well, two things. One, I'm a big LinkedIn guy just because like, I, you know, my best content, I'm able to put up on LinkedIn without all the bazaars. And, you know, I'm a Facebook guy too, but my books are on collectibleexchange.com and they're free. So you just go to Collectible Exchange, just pay for the shipping, you get the books free. I love all three of my books. I'm in the middle of writing a fourth, which is going to be completely out of the box that you would never see coming. We'll have to save that for another conversation, but it's very, very unique and different. But good, good, good lessons. I think that I'm learning now that I'm going to share. But uh, Living on Purpose is my last book. If you're 40 years old and old, you got to read that book. You, know, you got to have balls is, is for anybody who loves inspiration and, and entrepreneurism. And the Business Playbook is a book that I specifically wrote for people in college or just starting off. It just gives you all the basic principles. And all those books are on my site. You know, I'm one of those guys that said, call me if you need anything and mean it. But like, if you message me on LinkedIn, I will follow up with you. I will call you back. Still to this day, and I'm 64 and I've been doing this for a long time. And so far, it's worked out for me. My wife thinks I'm crazy. Do you have a people? I said, you know, I, I call everybody back. That's what I do. And so much, and the more people don't do it, the more I'm even inspired to do it. So I'd leave you with one little note is follow up. The fortune's in the follow up. That's where all the money is. Because most people are a little lazy. They won't follow up with everyone. You just never know which roads are going to lead you to where. Really, really great advice. Brandon, this has been a really great, definitely a little bit of a departure from our usual, which is really cool. I think that our listeners are really gonna gonna like it. And um, thank you again so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. Good luck. And I uh, hope I will cross paths one day at, at some conference and we'll get to meet. Me too. Thanks a lot.